Okay, here I am. I'm back with uh, Kepler's famous equation, part three. Well, Kepler's this Kepler's famous equation, part three, will uh, discuss a little bit about part two because uh, I took a couple of shortcuts in part two which I shouldn't have done. So I want to explain those shortcuts in part two. In part two, I want to explain uh, the area of the small triangle. And then I want to uh, derive the equation of uh, the true anomaly in terms of uh, the eccentric anomaly in terms of the true anomaly. And so I want you to see how that's done, which I should have done that in, in uh, part two, but I took a shortcut and I shouldn't have done that. So let's get started. Okay, let's start over from uh, uh, this determining this small triangle. We have the red ellipse, which is the, the track of our, our uh, spacecraft. The semi-major axis, which is O, W and then OP. Angle theta is called a true anomaly measured from periapsis P to the spacecraft. And uh, angle E is called eccentric anomaly. And the true anomaly is measured from periapsis to the spacecraft in the direction of motion. We need to solve for E, the eccentric anomaly, to use the famous Kepler equation. Because as you can see, E is located the angle E in radians is located in this equation. So uh, let's continue. Let me first demonstrate why the height Y of the small triangle is P sine E. And ordinarily, you would think, well, why isn't uh, the sign of uh, the true anomaly is opposite over hypotenuse? So why isn't the sine theta r times sine of the true anomaly? Well, that's what I want to show you, why it's not that. Okay. What is the area of the small triangle? Well, the area of the small triangle is one half the base times the height. Okay. And the base is... Fm and the height is y. Now we know the the leg of the uh, large triangle, which is a times cosine of theta. Excuse me, a times the cosine of e. Okay, so that's from O to M. A times the cosine e is from is O to M. That's the base. If we subtract from the base Fm or r cosine theta, then we get c, which we already know, okay? And c is equal to, c divided by a is equal to this eccentricity. So c is equal to a times the eccentricity, a times the eccentricity, okay? Now we substitute in c. Okay, so we take the equation C equals A cosine E minus R cosine theta, and we substitute in C, and we get AE equals A cosine E minus R cosine theta, and then we solve for R cosine theta. R cosine theta is equal to A cosine E minus A times E. So R cosine theta is the base of the small triangle. Okay. What is the area of the small triangle? Well, now we have the base is equal to A cosine E minus AE. What is the height? Okay. Well, let's say our ellipse is X squared divided by A squared plus Y squared divided by B squared equals 1. Okay. Well, why do we say X, X squared divided by A squared? Okay. Well, Along the x-axis, we have a, and along the y-axis, we have b. So x squared a 
squared, x squared divided by a squared plus y squared divided by b squared is equal to 1, and we solve for y. Okay, so y squared over b equals 1 minus x squared divided by a squared. We just move x squared divided by a squared to the other side. Where x squared divided by a squared is equal to cosine squared e. Okay. And y squared divided by b is equal to 1 minus cosine squared e. Where cosine squared e plus sine squared e equals 1 from trigonometry. We know that, okay? So we just solve for sine squared e, and we get 1 minus cosine squared e, okay? So sine squared e is equal to 1 minus cosine squared e, and now we can substitute. And y squared over b is equal to 1 sine squared e. Okay, and y squared equals b squared sine squared e, therefore y equals b sine e. Let's continue. So now, what is the area of the small triangle? Well, we have the base is equal to a cosine e minus a e, right here the base, and the height now we know is b sine e from trigonometry. Okay. Now we prove why y equals the height equals b sine e. Now substitute in the correct terms for the area. And the area is equal to a cosine e minus a e times b sine e. And we get our area. This proof was for the slide in part two on the area of the small triangle. And that was a shortcut that I shouldn't have taken. Okay. Okay, let's continue. Now let's derive an equation to relate to eccentric anomaly E and the true anomaly theta. Because we need to know the E when given the true anomaly to find the time since periapsis, and that's why we need to derive this, because we need E. And how do we find E? Well, in order to use this time since periapsis, we need to know E. Let's do this using the base of the small triangle once again. The base of the small triangle, the base is equal to r cosine theta is equal to a cosine e minus a e. And the height, as we just saw, was b sine e. Using the Pythagorean theorem on a small triangle, we have r squared is equal to a cosine e minus a e squared, the base, plus the height squared, which is b squared sine e squared. So we're just using the Pythagorean theorem of a small triangle. Now let's solve this equation in parts. The blue part first, then the green part. So we're going to take this blue part and do it first. Okay. So let's multiply it out. And that's going to be a cosine e minus a e times a cosine e minus a e. And we multiply all these terms out. a cosine e times a cosine e, a cosine e times a cosine e, a cosine e times minus a e, right there, minus a e times a cosine e, right there, and minus a e times minus a e is right here, this part there. Okay. Here's our last equation. The red parts add, and the last parts turn positive. So we see these two red parts, they add up, and the last parts are negative times negative is a positive. A times A is A squared. E times E is E squared. Okay. So we come up with A squared cosine squared E minus 2EA squared times cosine E plus a squared e squared, okay? Now, this equation here is the blue part. Let's take the green part, okay? The green part was b sine e squared, and we square both sides of that. Now, adding into the equation for r, so 
our equation was r squared is equal to the blue part plus the green part, in which we've done it here, the blue part plus the green part. So we add those in. Okay. Let's continue. Here's our last equation, where we added in the blue and the green part. Okay, but now we got this b squared. We need to solve for that. Let's go back to the definition of the ellipse and find out what b squared is, okay? Okay. Using the Pythagorean theorem similar to the Pythagorean theorem for this ellipse is a squared is equal to b squared plus c squared, okay? And c over a is equal to e. So let's substitute in for that. What we'll do is we'll divide this equation through by a. Divide through by a squared. So a squared over a squared equals b squared over a squared plus c squared over a squared. Okay? And c squared over a squared is z squared. Okay? And what we're going to do is a squared over a squared is 1. So what we're going to do is we're going to solve for b squared over a squared. So we're going to move c squared over a squared to the other side. So that's 1 minus c squared over a squared. Okay. And so we solve for b squared over a squared. And as we said before, c squared over a squared is equal to e squared. Okay. And we multiply it through by a squared. b squared equals a squared times 1 minus e squared, okay? And so now we've determined what b squared is. Here's our last equation, and we know what b squared is. Well, we have b squared times sine squared e, and so we just substitute in b squared. And now we get b squared times sine e, okay? What is sine e? Well, we know from trigonometry Sine squared e is equal to 1 minus cosine e. So we substitute in for that. So now we have, in our r squared equation, we have this blue part. a squared times 1 minus e squared times 1 minus cosine squared e. Let's first solve this blue part. Okay. So we take this blue part and we multiply it out. Okay. Let's continue. Here's our last equation. Now, here's our final equation. We got to solve this, multiply it out. So what we do is a squared times 1 is a squared. a squared times minus cosine squared e, a squared minus cosine squared e, minus a squared e squared times 1, minus a squared e squared times 1, and minus a squared e squared times minus cosine squared e right there. And then uh, now to get the last equation for R and plug it in. Okay. So we get our last equation for R. Here's our last equation. And we plug in this green part. Okay. And so we plug in this green part. And it, once we multiply it through here by the, by the minus signs, minus times minus is a plus, we'll notice that These parts in red cancel out, okay? Right there, they cancel out. Right here. A squared minus A squared cosine squared E. A squared cosine squared E cancels out. Plus A squared E squared minus A squared E squared, they cancel out. So we end up with our last equation and these parts cancel out, all in red cancel out, and we have r squared equals minus 2a squared e cosine e plus a squared plus a squared e squared cosine squared e. And we factor out an a squared, okay? So we factor out a squared, and Lo and behold, this is a factored equation. 1 minus e cosine 
e squared is this. So we just substitute that in there. So r squared equals a squared times 1 minus e cosine e squared. Okay. Take the square root of both sides. We get r equals a times 1 minus e cosine e. Okay. Multiply through by a, we get r equals a minus a e cosine e. Okay. Now that we know the value of r, plug it into the base of the small triangle. Remember we, the equation for the base of the small triangle was r cosine e equals a cosine e minus a e. And way in the beginning, when we took the, the uh, Pythagorean theorem of the uh, small triangle, okay? So uh, this was the base. Okay, well, now that we know R, we can plug it in. Okay. And so R equals cosine theta, and we plug that in. And uh, we multiply it through by cosine theta. And we uh, factor out A. A, we factor out A. A is in each term, so we factor that out. All the red A's cancel out, as we said. We factor out cosine E, because cosine E is in two of those terms there. And the final equation links the eccentric anomaly to the eccentricity and the true anomaly. Okay. So the cosine E is equal to eccentricity plus, plus the cosine of the true anomaly divided by 1 plus eccentricity times the cosine of the true anomaly. Okay, let's continue. Okay, let's solve an example um, using this um, cosine E and uh, developing the E's for the Kepler's famous equation. And the example I want to solve is uh, showing you how to either do this in radians or degrees. And when, whenever you read a book, they'll say that um, uh, the E in Kepler's famous equations is in radians, which doesn't have to be true. Okay. And I'm going to show you that. Remember the values in e, Kepler's equation are in radians. Okay. I discovered that if you are using a calculator, you can convert E to radians and input all the values as radians, the first E and the second E, into the equation. But you must change the output of your calculator to output in radians, not in degrees. Let's continue. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Uh, we have a true anomaly. Well, let's do an example using radians. We have a true anomaly equals 280 degrees, and uh, eccentricity is equal to 0 0.39433. Okay, let's change degrees to radians. So uh, 280 divided by 180 times pi, that gives us uh, 4.8869 in radians. Okay, and here's our equation, cosine E is in uh as a, a cosine of our eccentricity. Okay, and here's our Kepler equation. Okay, so what we do is we take all these values and plug them in. We take theta and radians and plug in wherever E is. Okay, uh, the angle E. We put the eccentricity in plus cosine of E and it's in radians. One plus eccentricity times the cosine of E in radians. Okay. To get this, I changed my calculator in the setup to radians. Okay. So, okay. So, um, what we're doing here is there's my, my equation. Cosine E is 0 0.56797 divided by 1.06847. I added the top and the bottom parts. Now, remember, my calculator is in, set up to give output in radians. Okay, so cosine of E is equal to 0 0.53158.
And if I take the inverse cosine of that, it gives me an answer of E is equal to 1.01033. Since my calculator is in the radians mode, all output is in radians. If I hadn't done that, when I took the inverse of that, 0.53158, it would have given me an output in degrees. Okay, let's continue. Okay, here's our setup again. To get this, I changed my output calculator to give an output of radians. I did this in the calculator setup. Okay, <clears throat> now we take E and we plug it into our equation. Okay, and everywhere there's an E, we plug it in and it's all in radians, okay? And um, since my calculator output is in radians, I don't have anything to worry about here. I don't have to change anything. So I input, uh, wherever the E is, I put the radian, the radian E in. And then uh, I add up the top and divide through by the bottom, and I get time is equal to one, 1,262.98 seconds. Okay, let's continue. Now, let's do an example, but don't change the calculator, okay? I just leave everything the way it is. I know when degrees and radians are needed, okay? So I'm not going to change my calculator. So my equation here is cosine E is equal to E plus the cosine of theta plus divided by one plus e times the cosine of theta. Well, theta's in degrees, so I just plug in degrees, okay? And uh, I plug in my e and degrees, okay? And I add up the top and the bottom, and that gives me cosine e equals 0 0.53158. And and I take the inverse cosine of that, and that gives me 57.8876 degrees. Okay. Let's continue. So now here's my famous equation, Kepler's equation. So, okay. I take my 57.8876 degrees, and I change that to radians. Okay, so I got, now I have degrees and radians, okay. The first E is in radians, and the second E is in degrees, okay? So I input the first degree, the first E is in radians, and the second input is in radians, is in degrees, okay? And then I multiply my top and the bottoms, I take the sign, and I add, and I divide through by the denominator, and I get 1,262.98 seconds, which is exactly the same as I got before. Okay, so I can do it either way. I can do it all in degrees, or I can do it all in radians. If I do it all in radians, my calculator's got to be in the mode of radians. This would be big trouble if I forget to change my calculator back to degrees. If I do this, do it this way, because I will forget that my calculator is in the mode of radians, this will be big trouble down the road. Because if I'm taking degrees and expecting radians, and I'm what I'm going to do is be taking radians of radians, and that's going to give me put bring me into some big trouble. Excel only calculates angle and angles and radians, so I change there to angles and radians on a computer in Excel. Okay, let's do an example. Okay, we have this satellite is in orbit with a semi-major axis of 7,500 kilometers and an eccentricity of 0 0.1. Calculate the time it takes to move from a position 45 degrees past perigee to 135 degrees past perigee. Then calculate the time for it to move from 154 degrees and 180 degrees past perigee. Okay, so here's my eccentricity, and here's my semi-major axis. Uh, I put true, for true anomaly, in it, uh, I put in zeros because we're not going to be using this page for, for a true anomaly. I calculated my GM for Earth, and I want you to notice that 
the semi-major axis is in kilometers. So in the uh, Kepler equation for period, when I cube the kilometers and I divide through by GM, which is in kilometers cubed per second square, I end up with the cubic kilometers canceling, and I end up with second squared, and I take the square root, and I get seconds. Okay, so let's go make us a table. Here it is. I have a table. I brought over half the period from uh, Kepler's uh, period equation, which is from periapsis to apoapsis. Apsis is 3,231.88 seconds. So, okay, what I'm going to do is I, I took cosine of E, and for every value, I made a table. So for the first value, I got cosine E and E, I call A, that's for that value. For the second value, I call cosine E and E for B, I call that B. So for zero, I'm just going from zero to 45 degrees. So for zero, uh, here's my first value, and for 45 degrees, here's my second value, cosine E and E. Then I go from 45 degrees to 90 degrees. Here's my first value for 45, which should be the same as this one up here. Okay, because that's 45. And then for 90, is here's my cosine E and E. And then I go from 90 to 135. And here's my first value for E, cosine and E which should be the same as my last value, because that was 90 degrees, okay? So, uh, 135 degrees, here's my cosine of E and E, okay? Then I go from 135 to 154. It gives me my first value of E, which is the same as the last value here, because that was 135, okay? And then I go from 154, to 180, okay, and it gives me my cosine E and E for each value, and here are the times, and I just subtract TB from TA for each one, okay, to get the times, so to go from 0 to 45 is uh, 669.97 seconds, but to go from 45 to 90, well, I subtract 45 from 90, to get that, okay, there's TB minus TA. And I add all of those times, and you'll see they both agree with the, the uh, Kepler period time, okay. So it came out the same. So now I know the time for my satellite to move from periapsis at these values of angles to apoapsis. And I can put any degree in there. Uh, true anomaly degree, uh, and I can uh, track it. I can track my satellite, okay? So that's the purpose of doing that. Okay, well, this we've come to the end of Kepler's famous equation, part three. And uh, I enjoyed doing this video. Mathematics is fun. Until next time, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you've learned something. Uh, I'm going to do more uh, uh, videos on, on orbits, so uh, this, this is a very important one I want to show you. Thank you.